Hey, it's Tom here and welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're going to go through and do a stock analysis of a business by the name of Stellantis. Now, Stellantis is actually a recent merger, which is basically a combination of what was previously the Fiat Chrysler business and what was previously uh, the PSA group. So we now have two kind of Goliath car companies in that uh, automotive industry have come together to form the one business called Stellantis. So I want to go through and give you basically a bit of an overview of the company and the brands that are now within that uh, Stellantis entity and also talk through basically my summary of a recent uh, investor presentation and webinar that they sort of held going through some of the financial performance for both Fiat Chrysler and the PSA Group individually and sort of their, their last six months of operations as two separate companies and some of the expectations for the business now that they've merged. Now, uh, one thing I'll mention is that if the lighting in this video looks kind of bad, uh, that's because it's still dark outside and the sun is still coming up. Uh, by my calculations, the sun should be coming up as I sort of film this video. So hopefully the lighting uh, gets better as we go through, but schedule has been kind of insane lately. So um, up early to film this one, but hope you enjoy the video nonetheless. Uh, and let's get straight into it. So um, the first thing I just wanted to mention is that a merger for the Fiat Chrysler Group specifically has been something that that business has been eyeing up for quite a long period of time. Now, um, for the past few years, the business has been run by the CEO, Mike Manley. Previous to that, we had a CEO by the name of Sergio Marchioni. Now, Sergio was the man that was responsible for really turning around the Fiat Chrysler business and specifically the Chrysler components of that. And a few years ago, um, before his unfortunate death and, and passing, which is why Mike Mike Manley was at the helm uh, in the last few years. Uh, he came out and did a presentation called Confessions of a Capital Junkie. Now, if you're uh, an investor in the automotive industry, certainly, but really in any capital intensive business, whether that is the traditional automakers or one of the newer automakers like a Tesla or a Neo or an airline business or an RV business or anything that's really capital intensive, I highly, highly highly recommend that you check this out this is a really insightful presentation on some of the inefficiencies that often go on in these capital intensive manufacturing businesses and uh, basically went through Sergio's logic behind why he thought that a merger would be really beneficial for Fiat Chrysler in particular now um, the basic idea in that presentation was that when you have uh, several different car companies and brands uh, right around the planet, there is a lot of basically unnecessary spending on R&D. Now, uh, anytime that you get into a vehicle, whether that's a Peugeot or a Honda or a Ford or a Maserati or a Tesla or whatever it might be, there are quite a few parts that go into making one of those vehicles that need to be differentiated, that need to be different from uh, you know, any other car brand. So for example, if you get into uh, a Maserati, you'd expect that the dash and the gear stick and the steering wheel and everything would probably look quite different than what you would get in a Chrysler or a Fiat or a Peugeot or some other brand, right? So there's quite a lot of parts that can go into those cars that are differentiated. And each individual brand needs to spend money on developing each of those parts uh, and designing the sort of overall car to build the end product for the end user. Now, uh, although that's true, there are arguably even more parts that really don't need to be differentiated. And one of the famous examples that Sergio Marchioni actually gave in his presentation was something like a car horn. You know, when was the last time that you went out and bought a car or didn't buy a car specifically because the horn sounded different? So uh, when you merge together a lot of these brands, brands, uh, you really have the opportunity to, you know, only spend on R&D for parts like horns or specific drivetrain components really only once. And you can use that same uh, type of part and same technology actually across a lot of your brands. And that results in a huge efficiency boost, huge cost savings, and uh, it allows the industry to be much more profitable as a whole. You don't have all this unnecessary, basically duplicate spending from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different car companies, however many are, you know, all spending money to make the dri same drivetrain components and all spending the same money to make a horn and all the stuff that really doesn't need to be uh, differentiated between different car models and even between different car brands. 
And back in 2014, when Sergio gave that presentation, he estimated that the cost savings from a merger with Fiat Chrysler and some other large car company, uh, he estimated that the savings would be about two and a half to four and a half billion euros per year. So those are significant cost savings. Um, basically, that would go, go entirely to the bottom line. If you put a PE of say five on those uh, extra earnings from uh, those cost savings from that business, that results in a market value of anywhere from about 12 and a half to about 23 billion euros. And at the time, the Fiat Chrysler business was probably trading at only about 10 billion euros. So from going through a merger like this and having these cost savings uh, come through, uh, basically you are looking to at least double the intrinsic value of the business. So it is incredibly powerful for value creation. And now a few years after Sergio's passing, basically this Stellantis merger really represents a lot of the thoughts and ideas that Sergio had at the time. Uh, so it's pretty phenomenal to kind of follow along with the story and see that Fiat Chrysler are now really giving this a, a good go and, and trying to execute on Sergio's vision for the industry as a whole. Now, as an aside, Fiat Chrysler is actually a business that I used to have quite a large investment in, and I still have a small position in the new Stellantis entity post-merger. Uh, and it's actually the only business I've ever lost money on in the stock market and taken like a permanent loss of capital. So uh, in hindsight, that was actually quite a stupid decision <laughs> from me to, to sell when I did. But basically, I sold uh, once the quarterly results came out from uh, the really rough quarter that Fiat Chrysler had right through sort of the midst of the lockdowns and so on that first started. Uh, my, my logic there was basically I saw Fiat Chrysler having potential losses almost equivalent to their market cap at that time if you sort of annualize that out. And those are very big numbers. Now that doesn't tend to uh, help the bank balance a particularly large amount. And you know, I thought something like bankruptcy potentially would be um, a real risk and a bigger risk than it might have actually in fact ended up being. So um, since then that business actually rebounded quite well. I, I still hold about 30% of my original stake and I'm actually um, well into the green on that position now. So uh, in hindsight, I'd be a bit wealthier if I had held onto those shares, but that's uh, a bit of an aside. The original investment thesis from me actually was uh, basically sort of this Monash per IP of one idea. So it's really not a super high quality, high return on invested capital, long term compounder type business that a Warren Buffett would like to buy and hold for decades. It was really a business that was trading extremely cheaply, like three or four times earnings. And they had a plan to grow those earnings over time to a point where uh, if they hit those specific targets that they had set and the price didn't move for Fiat Chrysler, they'd be trading at a PE of one. And we know that, you know, well-managed growing businesses don't trade at a PE of one. And that was basically the investment philosophy that would uh, expect sort of a, a good multi-bag of return out of that entity. So um, that's just a bit of an aside, but let's get into some of the details of this investment case. Okay, so let's go through some of the things that came out of the merger. So um, we now have quite a massive portfolio of brands that fall into the Stellantis entity. Uh, so I'll just rattle them off here so that you can get a feel for kind of what lives within this business now. So uh, we obviously have Fiat and we obviously have Chrysler from the Fiat Chrysler uh, component of this merger. Uh, we also have Dodge, we have Ram, Jeep, Abarth, Lancia, Alfa Romeo, Maserati, Citroen, Peugeot, Opel, Vauxhall, uh, DS Automobiles, Mopar, and Fiat Professional. So uh, that is about 16 brands by my calculations. So we have quite a massive portfolio of different car brands within that company. Uh, and of course, if we're talking about the sort of synergies of being able to share parts between those different brands, basically the more number of brands you, you have in there, the higher number of brands and the higher number of car sales you have, uh, the more efficient that you tend to be able to be uh, with basically sharing R&D spend and parts and so on but between those different sort of business components. Now the other thing that happened when Fiat Chrysler merged with the PSA group is they actually paid quite a massive special dividend. Now uh, they paid about $2.24, I'm rounding up slightly there, but about $2.24 per share. At the time the share price was around $15, so if you had bought it just purely for the dividend you would have got about 15% of your capital back, uh, which I got that payment and that was a very nice uh, payment <laughs> even though I only have about 30% of my original position. I think that's by, uh, actually by far probably the largest dividend payment I've ever received in my life. So that was quite nice. Um, 
in March 2020, the stock actually briefly traded around only $6 a share, uh, in which case if you'd bought it then, you would have gotten close to a 40% dividend yield on that special sort of one-off dividend uh, pre-merger. So that's just a bit of a side note, but monster, monster dividend, which a lot of people were um, really betting on over the last couple of years for Fair Chrysler going into sort of this, this merger deal. So um, in terms of who's running this new company, um, that is a guy by the name of Carlos Tavares. Now, Carlos Tavares was the CEO of the PSA Group. Basically, he was part of the Renault business from 1981 to 2013. He's been in the automotive industry a long period of time. Uh, in 2013, he basically said that he wants to be a CEO. He wants to manage one of the big car companies and he ended up going to the PSA group and he's been at that business since 2014 and he has just a beastly track record. I mean, um, you know, Warren Buffett has this quote where uh, if you have a manager with a reputation for brilliance and a business with a reputation for poor economics, it's generally the reputation of the business that persists. Um, Carlos Tavares and the PSA group is a exception to that rule. So I'm going to put up a screenshot here of some of the margins from two of the PSA group's business segments. Firstly, the one that they call Peugeot Citroen and the DS group and also Opel Vauxhall. And basically what you'll see is that Carlos Tavares took particularly the Peugeot Citroen DS group from basically losing money to actually being quite a profitable business and having pretty good margins by automobile company standards. Uh, and he was on track to do exactly the same thing with Opel Vauxhall leading into this merger. Both of those business segments had a little bit of a, a pullback in 2020 for obvious reasons. Uh, but nonetheless, he was still able to have monster, monster kind of business turnaround results in both of those entities. So for the final half of the results presentation from Carlos Tavares at Stellantis in this first kind of uh, call with investors and the Q&A session and so on that they had afterwards, which I will link down in the description below if you're interested in checking that out. Um, basically, Carlos Tavares went through and described some of the goals that uh, his executive team have for the Stellantis business and some of the numbers that they gave in terms of guidance and uh, my interpretation of that's how that's going to impact the business's valuation and, and so on. So um, the first kind of three things that, that uh, Carlos Tavares says was Stellantis he views as a new company, a new mindset and on the move for radical choices. And one of the things that he really tried to drive home throughout that presentation is that they do not want to get cornered as a legacy car company which they're often sort of grouped into um, being that's what basically everyone gets called these days they're either Tesla or Neo or some other new pure electric vehicle company or they're a legacy car company that's kind of just how things are perceived at the moment he doesn't want to be a legacy car company and he did actually spend a good chunk of time talking about software development about autonomous vehicles and also about the electrification of their fleet uh, which I'll get to in a sec as well but that was kind of the core uh, message behind Carlos Tavares's uh, presentation was they don't want to be this legacy automaker they are willing to spend a lot of money to make some pretty radical changes and big developments in terms of electrifying their um, product offering for the end users so here's a few of the other things that um, basically came up if you simply combine the Fiat Chrysler business and the PSA group business together uh, you just simply smush them together with their 2020 results sort of pre-merger pre any cost savings from what I talked about earlier with duplicate parts and R&D spend and so on. Um, basically, you have a revenue number of about $134 billion. So this is not a small company by any means. Uh, you have an operating income margin of about 5.3%, but that was actually much higher in the second half of 2020. That's probably that 5.3% is probably uh, under representing the profitability of these businesses just because that includes the beginning of 2020, which was an extremely rough sort of time period for both of those companies. Uh, and we have free cash flow of about $3.3 billion, which again is massively underrepresenting probably what you'd call a normalized year. 
uh, in the second half of 2020 alone, the business actually produced close to $17 billion in free cash flow versus 3.3 for the full year. So they actually had quite a strong negative cash flow in the first full year of operations. But uh, nonetheless, that's kind of where we're sitting. So massive business, $135 billion. They actually guided to produce about $150 to $160 billion in revenue throughout 2021. And they expect to earn a margin of anywhere from about 5.5% to about 7.5%, which is a bit of a wide range. Uh, but that should land them with about 8 to $12 billion in sort of, in sort of a, an operating profit type figure. He also mentioned that when it comes to uh, sort of modernizing their product offering and uh, writing software for autonomous vehicles and electrifying their um, product suite and product offering and so on, that they actually also have a partnership with Waymo. Now this originally came from the Fair Chrysler business and Waymo is obviously Google's uh, sort of autonomous driving uh, kind of spawn that they have made, I guess as Pabri might call it. Uh, so they've partnered with Waymo in order to try and speed up the process of getting autonomous vehicles to market. So that was an interesting uh, sort of side note as well, and that's certainly going to be a strong focus for the business. Now going right back to Sergio Marchionne's vision for um, basically massive synergies in terms of cost savings for a merged entity like Fiat Chrysler and the PSA Group. Um, Carlos Tavares did spend a fair bit of time talking about that. So basically in the sort of steady state, a fully kind of merged entity, they expect to see cost savings of about 5 billion euros annually. So it is gonna take them a little while to get there, but $5 billion is not a small number by the uh, relative to the scale and the current profitability of these two companies, uh, which I'll get to in a second, how I think that might impact the valuation. Um, so they're looking to save about 5 billion euros annually. Now, it is gonna take them a while to get there. They think they're gonna have about 80% of that achieved by 2024. So we're not talking about getting all of these synergies in year one or two or three it is going to take some time to get those established and he thinks there's probably going to be about a one-off roughly four billion dollar sort of implementation cost of having these businesses work sort of closer together in order to realize some of those efficiencies so we spend four billion as a one-off and we get an extra five billion in cost savings per year sounds like a pretty good deal to me but there is of course a lot of kind of execution risk and um, you know a little bit of time to actually get those synergies established. So let's get to the pointy end of things and discuss the valuation. Now, uh, like I mentioned a bit earlier on, uh, I really first invested in Fiat Chrysler, not because it's a super high quality business and not because it's a long term compounder you can hold forever. I invested in Fiat Chrysler because it was just stupidly cheap at the time. And I want to see if that is currently the case for the new merged Stellantis entity or whether I think it might be in a few years time if they're able to execute on some of these synergies. Now, uh, uh, let's go through some of the numbers so so the business is guiding to produce about 8.25 to about 12 billion in operating profit that's in euros uh, this year we're also expecting uh, about five billion dollars a year in synergies once that's all established probably a few years from now uh, so basically if we add those two numbers together we get about 15.125 billion euros in sort of normalized profitability assuming that they're able to execute on these sort of synergies that they've been talking about for several years and assuming that the business does not grow or does not shrink it's sort of um, steady state at their current kind of level so so like i say that gets me to a little over 15 billion euros if we convert that to us dollars because uh, stellantis trades uh, on the new york stock exchange as well as in europe that lands us on a fraction under 18 billion us dollars in net income every single year now the current market cap of stellantis is 58 billion us dollars now let's fast forward into the future and assume that they can hit that level of profitability and let's assume also that the market cap has not changed so uh, the business is trading at the same price as it is today. Um, basically, if you do some simple maths and try to get a simple sort of PE ratio for the company, you're looking at a business that is trading at a PE of barely over three, about 3.25. So uh, by pretty much anyone's standards, that is pretty cheap, of course. Uh, the automotive industry tends to uh, get hit pretty hard when things do go south, like I've talked about a few times in this video. Uh, they do have sort of a lot of operational leverage, so anytime that revenue comes down a little bit, uh, profitability tends to go down a lot. Um, so that's certainly factored in, and these 
car companies do traditionally trade at quite low multiples, uh, but a 3.25 PE sounds kind of crazy to me. So uh, assuming that they can't execute on that, uh, Fiat Chrysler and PSA Group now merged together in Stellantis uh, could potentially be quite an interesting opportunity. Now, uh, a couple of other numbers I'm just going to throw out there, and I apologize if this sets a few people off. That is not my intention here. Um, but I'm just going to throw out two numbers. So I'm talking about uh, potential earnings from Stellantis of about 18 billion US dollars and a market cap of about 58 billion dollars currently. Now, if we compare that to a business by the name of Tesla, uh, Tesla currently earns about 690 million dollars, less than 1 billion dollars, about 0.7 billion dollars, uh, versus the 18 billion we're talking about with Stellantis. So, Stellantis is about 20 times larger in terms of profitability than Tesla. Um, and Stellantis currently trades at a $58 billion market cap. Tesla currently trades at about a $600 billion market cap. So you have a business that is 20 times as profitable and you have a business that is trading at one tenth of the price compared to Tesla. Now, I know that's an unfair comparison. I know Tesla is growing faster. I know Tesla has a head start on battery technology and autonomous driving. And I know they have some very... Uh, passionate customers and investors and so on um, but does that really justify that bigger gap in valuation that's something I'm just going to put out there for you to maybe ponder. So um, that's my thoughts on Stellantis. It's not a company that I will be uh, adding to my position in. I'm kind of just holding that 30% that I retained after selling a bit of my, my Fiat Chrysler position. Um, I'm just holding that 30%. I'm not adding to it right now. But I will be watching like an absolute hawk from the sidelines to see how they execute on this plan over the next few years. And I will be also watching very closely how that compares to the price of the business because if it does get to one of these monos per bright p of one style situations again i may well become very interested so that's all for me today i do hope you enjoyed the video and the sun is just starting to come up we don't have great lighting yet but we are getting there uh that's it from me i do hope you enjoyed the video if you did please hit like and hit subscribe and i will see you in the next one cheers